Hey, this is Josh for Retool.net, and in this video, we're going to talk about the new fall update to Premiere Pro CC 2015. Now, I might as well start right at the beginning with what you'll notice as the new start screen in Premiere. Now, this is different than the old welcome screen. You'll see that there are three main tabs here. You have your recent projects, you have your libraries, and your sync settings. You can also, of course, do a new project or open project from here. And I assume there will be some advertisements and such coming in here, but it doesn't seem to be loading properly on my computer right now. So anyway, I'm gonna open up a recent project and we can start talking about some of the changes. So I have this project just called Test. And uh, let's talk about a few things that are new to Premiere. So if I go to my project panel, and I'm gonna actually switch it over to my icon view. Now, if you are using a touch-enabled computer, whether that's a Windows laptop with a touchscreen or a Mac with a trackpad or Windows computer, of course, with a trackpad as well, there are some new touch features that you'll find in Premiere Pro CC 2015 this fall update. So let me show you what some of those do. Now, if I turn touch on on my Wacom tablet here and I come down to my project panel, You'll notice that I can now pinch to zoom. I could come in here and just use a pinch just like I would on my phone and I could zoom in or out that way. Now that isn't the only thing I could do of course if I click on a clip and I could do this with my mouse as well if I have the right options on. Now if you're on a touch enabled screen this should show up by default but I'm just going to come over and check this box in my project panel options that says thumbnail controls for all pointing devices. Now that will let you use this with a mouse as well if you like. I don't know why you would do it this way. I would probably use the keyboard. But if you are using a touch interface, this starts to make a lot more sense. So I'm actually gonna hit the tilde key to make this panel full screen so we could see it nice and big. Now of course I could hover scrub as I could before, but if I actually use my Wacom tablet to click on the clip, you'll notice that I have these heads up display controls as well. I can click on this one to go one frame at a time backward. I can click on this to set an endpoint. Of course, I could play as well and stop, and now I'll set an out point. Now, I could do this with all my clips, of course. I can then come in and drag them over to my program monitor. Now you'll notice all these new overlay settings, and this is regardless of whether you're using a touch interface or not. These options will show up, which are actually a lot more elegant than the old ones. I can do an insert edit before the playhead or the current clip. I can do after the current clip. I can just insert right at the playhead. Do an overlay edit to do it on the track above, a replace edit, or an overwrite edit. So there's a number of options you can see here, and it's actually a welcome change, even though I don't tend to use touch interfaces um, or drag and drop to the program monitor this much, I, I do see how this is helpful, giving you a few more options and much clearer and more modern of an interface for doing that. Now another thing that Adobe hasn't really been showing off in the new feature notes of the program is the ability to hide the title bar, which is really just showing the path of the project, and also in the case of a Mac, the X and the minus and plus symbols. The way you do that is you hold the command key on a Mac, control key on a PC, and the backslash key. And you'll see it just makes that title bar disappear, which I don't really see why you need for the most part, especially if you're working in a full screen environment. That's definitely a welcome change that'll help save some screen real estate. Another interface based change is the ability to use stack panels. So if I click on the effects workspace, you'll see a workspace that's already using this. So you'll notice when I click on one, the others disappear. And it's similar to what we had previously in the Lumetri color panel. So if I clicked on Creative, for instance, the other ones hide, or basic correction, the other ones hide, that's the solo mode. So if I'm using it in, say, the effects mode, I could click on any one of these and the other ones will hide. Now that's an option, of course. I can come over here and click on this and go to panel group settings. I could shut off solo, and now I can see multiple panels at once. Also, I can change whether I'm seeing this as a stack group panel or as tabs as I was previously used to. So if I go back to a stack group panel and I'm gonna set it back to solo mode. 
actually it's already on that setting. So if I didn't have this set up, let's say I was just in my editing mode and I wanted to work that way, I could of course do the same thing by clicking here, panel group settings and going to stack group mode and that would allow me to work that way. Obviously if it's a larger window you might still have to scroll anyway, but it's a nice way to be able to collapse some windows but still have quick access to them. And depending on what mode you're working in, it can really be helpful to save some screen real estate. Now, one of the big changes that is coming to this release is optical flow based speed changes. So on my timeline here, I've already actually set up two clips. The first one is a 30% slowdown of a clip. And the second one is also a 30% slowdown of the same clip. The first one, if you watch, you'll notice it's very stuttery. Now, this is the traditional Premiere Pro frame blending and it's stuttery and doesn't look great. And in the past, you would have had to have taken this to After Effects or use a third-party effect like Twixter. But on this one, I've applied Premiere Pro's new optical flow. Now, of course, same caveats as using a plugin like Twixter. It can create some artifacts, but in this case, it's doing a really nice job of just smoothing out that motion and making it so you don't have to go into a third-party tool to do this. Now, let me show you how I enable that. Let me just hit Command R just to get this back to 100%. And I'll set Ripple Shift on. And now when I go back to this clip, it was actually shot at a bit of a slow-mo, so it's still slow. But in this case, I'm going to hit Command R, set it to 30%. But this time, I'm going to check Optical Flow. And if I hit OK, it's now been enabled for that clip. I could also enable it by right clicking on the clip and going to time interpolation optical flow so I could do it after the fact if I had already done a speed change normally or I could even do it before I enabled a speed change. Now let me just change the percentage to something like 35 and just the reason I wanted to do that is to show you that when you're doing optical flow if I hit play and as evidenced by the red render bar here, you'll see it's just doing frame blending until I then hit render. And then it'll render out the clip so I could see it actually optical flow speed change. So once that's done, I could show you how it looks. And now that we have it at 35%, you'll see it did a nice job of smoothing out that motion without too many noticeable artifacts. Now another change is the ability to show effects that have been placed on the master clip effect of clips right in your project panel. So let me show you what I mean. Uh, let's say I have this clip here. I'm actually going to shut off the thumbnail controls so we don't see those for now. And I'm going to load this into my source monitor and I'll go up to the effects control. Now if I go to my effects window, I'm just going to do something really obvious like a fast blur and throw that on the master clip effect of that clip. And if I go to my source monitor, you'll see it's blurry of course, but you'll also notice that my thumbnail and my hover scrub has been updated in my project panel to address that. Now this probably isn't the likely use case of this, maybe it's a color correct, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a really dark clip that you made lighter and now it's easier to see what the content is in the project panel. But overall that is a helpful change that you can shut off if you want to by checking thumbnail show effects applied and if I do that it goes back to normal. But I actually like that setting on. Another new feature that Adobe hasn't made much of a big deal out of in this release is the ability to shift overlapping track items during a ripple edit. So let me show you what I mean. Now the behavior I'm going to show you is what it was in the past and still is by default in this new version. So if I do a ripple edit here and just trim this out a little, you'll notice the clip on track one moves, but these two don't move at all. Uh, and that's the way it's been. So let me just undo that. If I go to Premiere Pro preferences and trim, if I click this new box that says shift clips that overlap trim point during ripple trimming, and I hit OK on that. Watch what the new behavior is. I'm going to hit Command, and I'm going to click just to the left of the edit point, and watch what happens. 
you'll notice it now does affect these two tracks and actually splits those clips. So that may be desired, it may not, but it's just something you should know that is now available to you as a preference. I'm gonna actually disable that, which is the default, but you can do whichever behavior you like better. I could totally see the argument for either. Now there are a number of other small things that I'm not gonna get to talk about in this update, but I will talk about a few of those small things right now. If I go to the color panel, for instance, you'll notice that the curves tab has grid lines that have been added. And this just helps you to figure out where your shadows, midtones, highlights, and respective darks and light points are. And it's just something that I guess a lot of users requested because they're used to seeing it in other applications. Another new feature is the ability to export to the H.265 or HEVC standard and a number of other formats have also been added. You can check the link that I'm gonna include in the notes for some of those additional formats. And another quick thing I'll show you is the ability when you're exporting to have a few different effects in there. Uh, you can have, for instance, the video limiter effect that is in the effect tab of your export. You can also have the new SDR conform effect, which is if you're working with high dynamic range color correcting, which has been added in this release as well. I just haven't displayed it because I don't have any HDR media to show it off with. And you could have it match back to standard dynamic range for things like broadcast and have it correct for that. The other thing, if you have audio in your timeline, you can have an audio loudness check done on export as well. So a bunch of little things and a few big things that have been added to this new release and I hope you guys enjoy it and let me know if you have any questions. Be sure to check out our new product, Color Retooled, which is a set of looks presets for Premiere Pro CC. A ton of easy presets that you can use in Premiere and Speedgrade CC to quickly edit the look of your clips. Everything from brightness and contrast to vintage effects to things like vignettes that editors can quickly add to their clips and keep working. Also check out Relink Retooled, our conform tool for Premiere and Final Cut that will let you conform to your QuickTime media of different durations and file names than your original media. You can use it with combinations of tape name, file name, and of course you can use partial tape name and file name combined with metadata like time code and frame rate to help you relink your clips quicker and easier than ever before.